Few of us would doubt that happiness is an integral part of well-being and wellness. But did you know that our attitudes and our behaviors towards other people are an integral part of our personal wellness as well? I'm Rodolfo Mendoza Denton of the Department of Psychology at UC Berkeley. I'm your host for today alongside Dri Cavusi, ASUC senator and fourth year undergraduate. Today, we're gonna to be talking about happiness, gratitude, and compassion. And to talk about these topics, I'm joined today by a distinguished panel of guests. They are Dacher Keltner of the Department of Psychology at UC Berkeley, my colleague, as well as the founder and director of the Greater Good Science Center. Huria Jazairi, an expert on compassion and also with the Greater Good Science Center, and Dr. Emiliana Simon-Thomas, the science director of the Greater Good Science Center and also at UC Berkeley. Welcome everybody, I appreciate your time. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege. Here. So let's get started right into the topic of happiness. Absolutely, so Doctor, can you elaborate upon how happiness is viewed as a science? How? So it's, it's, it's a really young science. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, people have been thinking about what happiness is really since uh, people have been thinking about who human beings are. And you can look at you know, different philosophies like East Asian thinking and it emphasis, its emphasis on social harmony and duty and bringing out the good in others. The Greeks had a lot of speculation about how virtue is related to happiness. And what scientists have done in the last 30 years or so uh, from different parts of the world is really arrived at a consensus that happiness, as complicated and multicultural as it is, can really boil down to a few things. One is how many positive emotions you feel on a regular basis, kindness, compassion, gratitude, awe, beauty, and the like. A second thing, uh, very familiar today, is how do you handle stress, right? How do you handle economic difficulties or difficulties raising kids or in a romantic relationship? So how do you handle tension? And the third, which um, I, I actually think is probably the, one of the most important pieces to this is relationships, you know? how. What's the strength of your ties to your family and your friends and acquaintances and work colleagues? So positive emotions, handling stress, and relationships kind of get us to a scientific understanding of happiness. That's excellent. And did that all come out of the Greater Good Science Center? I know you're the founder. Um, can you elaborate upon that? Or? Yeah, you know, so here at Berkeley, we have the Greater Good Science Center, and um, as the field the scientific study of happiness was really getting off the ground 15, 20 years ago. Uh, a couple of Cal alumni decided that we, they wanted to help create uh, a center at UC Berkeley that really studies happiness and promotes it. Uh, and, and you know, Emiliana, for example, you know, is working uh, full time there and can sort of give a sense of the programs. And, yeah, so at the Greater Good Science Center, what we, what we try to do is keep track of the cutting edge studies that are looking at happiness, that are looking at things like people's social connections, how kind people tend to be in the world, how well they are um, connected with their communities. And um, we, we, we write about it in a way that's accessible to the popular audience. We write about it in a way that's useful for teachers or people who are leaders in their workplaces. Um, we also have events, so people come and, and spend a day hearing from a luminary in the field about sort of how a particular aspect of connecting with others socially or uh, dealing with stress or handling difficulties can uh, actually boost their own happiness. Um, we also support research uh, both in, in fellowships to graduate and undergraduate students and on occasion uh, to faculty around the nation to study these issues. And in particular, we recently did a, a program on gratitude. It's excellent. So what, what would you say are the underlying mechanisms uh, physiologically behind happiness? Yeah. So, I, you know, um, I, I, I think how you can think about it is that, you know, evolution has created in the nervous system, and Emiliana uh, has done a lot of neuroscience on this as well as others, which is we have this big fight or flight part to our brain and our neurophysiology that what lies below the brain stem, you know, and it's old parts of the brain, like the amygdala, communicating with this, what's called the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And that part of your body really revs you up to fight or flee. And when it's chronically active, you, um, you tend to have health and happiness difficulties. What's fascinating and, and really new scientific terrain is we have whole other regions to the, the body that help us care 
and share and to get along with others and empathize. And so it's parts of our frontal lobes. It's an old part of the brain that Emiliana and I studied called the periaqueductal gray. It's neurotransmitters like oxytocin. It's the vagus nerve that slows your heart rate and allows you to communicate with others. That is a bundle of nerves that wanders all the way through your body. Um, so what that tells us is not only is happiness uh, kind of this important ethical concept, but it's down there in our nervous system to understand with the tools of science. Well, so how can an average student activate all these underlying <laughs> mechanisms that we have? You know, it, it's not too different from the principle of physical exercise. Okay. Really, our nervous system is a trainable phenomenon. Uh, it, it's, it's like a sponge that absorbs repetition in the universe. And as it sees relationships, it sort of holds on to them and then makes predictions and behaves according to assumptions that are dr drawn from those relationships. So I guess in short, how we behave every day becomes our habit of behavior. And those habits of behavior are a function of our nervous system. You know, our brain and our body and our behavior are all sort of uh, integrated. And so if we decide, well, I'm going to try to, I, I've understood from some kind of article, something that Dacker said, or maybe something from Huria, that compassion is really important for happiness. So what I'm going to do is, is try to become more compassionate. And there are scientists, including Horia, who have developed programs and specific ways and behaviors and, and, uh, in order to be more compassionate. And, and as you do that and you repeat that, you're shifting your nervous system. You're engaging these systems that Dacker talked about. But Horia, wouldn't somebody worry that if they try to make themselves happier, mm -hmm. just as I might try to make myself more physically fit, mm -hmm. that I might actually end up becoming more unhappy? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, there is some interesting research that suggests that there's the paradoxical effects of, of pursuing happiness. And I think that there's a bit of a misnomer about what is happiness. And mm -hmm. I think uh, really defining happiness in the way that Dagger has described um, and studying it in that way, I don't know that there are adverse uh, consequences to uh, engaging in behaviors, as Emiliana mentioned, that are uh, increasing your health and well-being. It could be something as simple as um, choosing to eat your lunch outside rather than yeah. sitting in front of your computer. Or it could be something as small as choosing to uh, turn off your lights 10 minutes earlier and to read a book that you've been meaning to get through. Um, we're not talking about uh, taking a trip to Tahiti, although that's fantastic if you can do that. Um, I wouldn't discourage that by any means, but um, changing small things in your life that uh, bring added value and you see differences in positive affect and, and generally reductions in negative affect. So uh, take your lunch outside or read that book you've been meaning to get to and if you can, plan a trip to Tahiti. In other words, not necessarily focusing on, am I happy, am I happy, am I happy, right. but rather engaging in behaviors that, that kind of as a positive side effect might lift your mood. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah, you know, coming out of the science of happiness um, that we've, we've just introduced, a lot of scientists got interested in really specific practices, right? Almost like mm -hmm. exercises, to use Emiliana's analogy. And so it's like, it, just to get outside and look at beautiful trees, mm -hmm. a study in our lab found makes people and feel less entitled, more modest, more kind to other people and happier. So there are all these very specific habits you can integrate into your life to promote the happiness quotient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people think of it as setting the priority rather than pursuing happiness. So, so organizing yeah. your life around uh, affording yourself those experiences and the behaviors that science suggests actually sort of bestow happiness upon us rather than Again, sort of trying in this meticulous way, I'm going to measure my happiness today, and if it hasn't gone up this much by tomorrow, then I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. That's definitely a losing prospect. There's a lot of research that suggests that you know, our behaviors contribute to our emotions. So what you choose to engage in is influencing how you feel. So um, if I am engaging in things that are uh, meaningful and important to me, exercise or nature, or social connection, then it's likely that I'm gonna feel better and positive affect, but um, test it out yourself. And is it okay to not feel happy all the time? I know as, as gra undergrads and graduate students mm -hmm. and even professors and faculty, we're all under a ton of stress and there's just some days that, you know, 
you can't even force a smile. What do you, what do you have to say to that? Well, you know, um, absolutely. And, and one of the things that you learn from, um, you know, the science of happiness and also the science of emotion is each one of these emotions, even the really pro what we would think of culturally as the problematic ones, like anger or fear or stress, they have their purpose, mm -hmm. right? And they have their place in life. So anger, when used in the right way, as often has been done at Berkeley, leads to positive social change, right? Um, so I think one of, the, you know, one of the themes in the happiness literature uh, that Emiliana has done a lot of work on is um, just being mindfully accepting of the tough stuff of life, right? So if you're stressed out about a test or kind of the, the balance in your checkbook, um, if you can just sort of mindfully take that in and not react to that condition, you end up doing a lot better. And it is at its core accepting these more problematic times in life as a, a key to happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's some fun data that Dacker and I have played around with looking at how people around the world use little symbols that represent their emotional states. And it turns out that uh, in, in areas where people use a wide variety of emotions in a sort of systematic way, rather than always saying they're happy or joyful or exuberant or always saying they're angry, uh, in mm -hmm. fact, those who use the full palette of emotions mm -hmm. and use them in kind of a, a, a regular fashion are the ones, are the populations where people are doing the best, mm -hmm. right? There's the least um, uh, sort of early infant mortality. There's more generosity amongst people who live living, living in those places. So, so there's some real benefits to having that array of mm -hmm. emotional experience. Yeah. But again, as Dacker suggested, not necessarily letting them stick mm -hmm. when they don't need to. Yeah. Uh, we don't need to be angry for, mm -hmm. for days, weeks, months. We don't need to be sad. In fact, it's, it's problematic when we are. But we do need to be sad when we've suffered an irrevocable loss. And we need to signal that mm -hmm. to the people around us when we want support. Mm -hmm. So well, negative right. feelings are very important mm -hmm. to happiness. And I think in reality, emotions aren't binary. It's not either that you're happy or that you're sad, mm -hmm. but it's really the spectrum and these shades of gray. And some of the most interesting emotions, in my opinion, such as compassion or awe, are actually this interesting blend of both positive and negative emotion. And I think that's really what's representative of our daily life, is that we're not happy, we're not sad, but it's some interesting blend of all of these things, as Emiliana mentioned. Huria, I would love to pick up on this idea of compassion being a blend of positive and negative, and maybe we can talk about this in the next segment, but let me just take a moment to summarize a little bit of where we are. Dacker, you spoke about uh, the science of happiness as, uh, as encompassing Positive emotion, uh, the amount of positive emotion that one experiences, uh, coping and dealing with stress, as well as social ties. Uh, you spoke about the very popular fight or flight tendency that we have, but uh, pointed out that there's much less attention to pay, pay to the care and share aspect of our physiology. And we spoke about some ways in which we might be able to harness that or access, as, you're, as, you, as you so ably asked about, access that care and share tendency. And it's not so much by actively pursuing the happiness, but rather, I think as you said it, by setting the priority, those mm -hmm. small changes that you can make in your life that might create a little bit of a difference. I love mm -hmm. this idea of, uh, of picking up that book, mm -hmm. like the one I have been, you know, on my, on my shelf for like <laughs> two months at the moment. <laughs> I like the eating your lunch outside. <laughs> Especially in Northern California. It's, yeah. thing, it's, a, it's a luxury nice. to be able to do yeah. that. Absolutely. And I know you touched on gratitude. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? Um, how, do, how does one practice gratitude? Are you thanking everyone you pass on the street? Mm -hmm. what? <laughs> yes, I mean, gratitude is this wonderful, also somewhat young science. Um, I mean, it, it is that simple. It is that simple. It could be, yes, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to be much more conscientious of, of what comes to me that I didn't necessarily work for. So there are things that we do that we put all this energy into and then the right thing happens and we feel great about it. But there's all this stuff that we have that we enjoy. There's all these experiences around us that, that we didn't have to really do anything to get or to gain. And it's often and, and almost always at the, at the consequences of other people's efforts. And so sort of recognizing that or, or considering that more frequently is, is this really powerful experience that Bob Emmons sort of pioneered a whole science around showing that when people do that more, 
they're happier, they're healthier, they're more uh, satisfied in their relationships, they're more connected to their communities. There's all these incredible, incredible advantages to just being a more grateful person. Absolutely. You know, and it's, I, I mean, just thinking about the very simple everyday practice of it, uh, Amy Gordon in our lab did a study where romantic partners, um, to the extent that they just expressed appreciation to one mm -hmm. another face to face, just said thanks or patted them on the back or even like nodded their head when somebody <laughs> was saying something, partner was saying something, those couples uh, were less likely to break up six months mm -hmm. later, right? So it's just these simple acts of mm -hmm. appreciation or gratitude or kindness that really build up to things. Is it, can it be forced at first? Because I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. it can be really hard to, you know, say thank you and really. There is a kind of fake it till, you'll, <laughs> till you make it okay. um, possibility for some mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, for most though, I think gratitude kind of is, is familiar. Yeah. I, I mean, it's one of the reasons I think it's so interesting. It's not, it's not a hard sell. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness can be a little bit yeah. tricky because some people feel ex you know, like it's not really part of their tradition, but mm -hmm. most traditions have celebrated and, and, and advocated gratitude as a, as a positive value. Um, so we can think more deeply about gratitude and appreciation for uh, sort of privilege or health or these sort of more metaphysical constructs, or we can think about gratitude towards people right. and they're a little bit different. And when you do wanna get a, a little bit more muscly about it, to go back to my exercise <laughs> analogy, um, gratitude towards people is, is, is actually more powerful. And, and gratitude towards people involves noting what the person did. Saying, oh, I, I want to tell you what it is that you did. Noting, acknowledging the effort. I appreciate that you put this much time in your day into doing what you do. And then also articulating how it is that it benefited you. Mm -hmm. So when you do those three things, you're sort of, that's the full range, the most powerful uh, kind of gratitude that one can practice. And it really is transformative. It really changes how you see other people and how you see yourself in the world. And, you know, even though oftentimes people say that I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, the leather interior in my Ferrari or whatever it may be, um, there's actually someone who took time to hand stitch that leather interior in your Ferrari, for example. And so um, while we sometimes are grateful for things, there's generally many, many people, and this goes back to the topic of compassion um, and our inner relatedness, that there are many people who have made that latte or that car or this shirt possible, and we can express gratitude to, to them in a way. So Huria, that, that just makes me think of, you know, the, the, you know, our current society where, you know, so many of the things that used to be personal are now impersonal. Mm -hmm. the, the boxes that you get at your door as opposed mm -hmm. to the financial yeah. transaction that you had to, that you had to give mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, as, as an example, is mm -hmm. gratitude at risk? I don't think so because you know what there's someone that drove that truck to my house and there's someone that worked in that factory to make the product and there is someone that created the software that has the invoice that gets in my package and uh, there's so many people involved with getting you know I, I ordered new highlighters this week that mm -hmm. arrived at my door in two days which is pretty remarkable uh, and there's so many people that were behind that and I could just pick them up and, and just disregard the box and go on my merry way. But really, my life is possible because of so many people whom I'll never meet um, and who are supporting me. I was just gonna say that along that lines of the question that you just asked, there's this um, idea about entitlement, that entitlement yeah. is something that our culture or our society is sort of suffering with, that people have the sense of what they deserve and they're angry about what they're not getting. And, and there are many thinkers in the gratitude science field who, who really have discovered um, that, that gratitude is kind of an antidote to entitlement. Mm -hmm. so, so as Huria's story revealed, you could, you could get your highlighters and be like, ah, oh, the corner of the box is dented, and <laughs> damn it, I deserve a perfect box. Or instead, when you open it and you see everything that's come and you consider the kind of almost magic behind that mm -hmm. experience of having received this thing that you needed that really you had so little to do with mm -hmm. in terms of uh, its, its utility for yourself. Um, that whole entitlement, entitlement kind of in, in instinct or, or reaction is, is, is not available. And on the other side of the spectrum of entitlement, I definitely see with gratitude there can be a lot of guilt 
that comes mm -hmm. with practicing mm -hmm. gratitude. What, what would you say to someone who has so much and they're so thankful for it, but you know, they're kind of enabled by their own sense of guilt for mm -hmm. having all these things? Mm. Is that something y'all come across? Well, I think that um, the, I mean, I mean, I think guilt's an interesting mm -hmm. um, uh, emotion to cast within the kind of the terms of the conversation we've been having. There are new studies coming out by former Berkeley grad Frank Lynn, Flynn showing that guilt actually for people in positions of leadership is um, a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. it motivates kind of these pro-social tendencies. They feel like, wow, I have all this advantage and I have this privileged position. Uh, maybe I should do things to mm -hmm. kind of make sure other people appreciate it. Um, you know, I think that um, one of the things that we notice in our research, which may be at the heart of your question, Dree, is that we do find, regrettably, that people who have a lot given to them in life, um, who are born into really well-to-do circumstances, uh, and this is work I did with Rudy, too, um, don't, aren't as appreciative of their condition as you might imagine, it's right? It's that entitlement. Yeah, yeah, and they don't respond to other people's concerns as powerfully as people who have less. And, and then I think that's part of the provocative question you're posing, which is, um, you know, why is it that some people who have a lot may not be as appreciative or grateful or compassionate? And in that instance, I think guilt would be a little bit of a good thing. So does that mean that uh, gratitude may be more important for those with privilege than for those without privilege? You know, one of the things we've been working on with all of this sort of privilege work we've done is, uh, you know, um, what are the benefits of these um, positive emotions? You know, you find that uh, people with a lot of wealth aren't as happy as you would expect them to be. Mm -hmm. And one of the canonical findings in the happiness science is the correlation between wealth and happiness is 0.12, small. After a middle class income, money gets you no happiness. And I think that's because it takes away from these pro social emotions that, you know, of gratitude and. Right. And so we got to re-inject gratitude and all into the lives. Okay. Right. Regardless of who we are. So again, to summarize, we've, we've covered how um, it really stood out to me how the small moments of gratitude, I, th I think the phrase you used was for things that you are not necessarily responsible for, mm -hmm. uh, are important. Uh, small moments of gratitude towards others as opposed to the more abstract things in life yeah. can, be, can lead you to better Happiness, fitness, as we might, you know, as, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. correct on that. Oh, that's right. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and and then the idea of faking it till you make it. In other words, as Dre pointed out, sometimes it can feel weird to say thank you uh, because you may not feel like you mean it. But the idea is that over time, those you can learn to mean and actually take a moment of mindfulness to mean that thank you mm -hmm. when you say mm -hmm. it. Well, you get reinforced. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part of it. You say thank you to someone and someone responds to that. And our nervous systems like that. Mm -hmm. We like it when somebody feels good and smiles at us and, and, and gives us that, that sort of energetic connection. Oh, maybe they touch us. Uh -huh. or that, you know, any of that sort of socially connecting experience right. is intrinsically reinforcing at the level of the brain and the body. And so, yeah, we start doing it more because it feels good. So talking about uh, gratitude, you know, the other pro-social emotion that we've uh, wanted to touch on today is compassion. Absolutely. So why, why is it important to practice compassion? What is compassion? Yeah, what, does that lead to happiness? <laughs> well, I'll let Emiliana take this one. Um, there's sure. a really great psych bulletin article that Emiliana and, and Dacca wrote about really looking at uh, compassion through historical and evolutionary perspectives. But um, what is compassion and, and... So it's a great question because a lot of people think of compassion, sympathy, pity, empathy, and they don't know how any of those are really different from one another. Um, what we did, Dacker, myself, and Jen Getz, one of Dacker's former students, was really kind of break it all apart and figure out, well, what, when does it start? What makes people begin to feel compassion? What happens along the way? And then how does it actually end up at compassion? And it, and it turns out that when you think about it that way, compassion is this feeling that you have when you're in the presence of, of someone else's suffering, or, or even if you're thinking deeply about, about suffering in the world, that is sort of peppered with a, a strong desire to, to help, to alleviate that suffering. 
Like it's, it's a kind of interesting blend emotion. You're feeling moved that, mm -hmm. that something is not right with another person's well-being. And then you're sort of using that to fuel some kind of inspiration or motivation to, to be of assistance in that mm -hmm. moment. So that's how we think about and try to define compassion. Absolutely. So I know being on uh, Berkeley's campus, there are a lot of protests, there's a lot of controversy. And, you know, as a student, I've felt myself moved by these protests, wanting to be involved. But at what expense? You know, sometimes students get so invested in it, they themselves end up unhappy. What do you, what do you have to say? How, how do you practice compassion while cultivating your own sense of self-compassion? Well, it, it's really interesting because oftentimes there's this misnomer that compassion requires a behavior. Mm -hmm. It requires doing something pro-social or altruistic. It requires giving up something that's mine, a resource, whether it's money or time or food. And in Emiliana's definition, there's actually no behavior that's associated with compassion. It's uh, seeing suffering, feeling moved by suffering, having a wish to have that person relieved of their suffering, and that motivation to do something without necessarily doing something. You could, uh, but you don't actually have to get out there and protest. You don't have to give time or resources. While all, the, all those things are, are wonderful, compassion is really in some sense, just looking up from our devices and recognizing that people are in pain and, and, and are suffering in some way. Mm -hmm. And when we say suffering, uh, it doesn't have to be a war in a foreign country. It could be someone dealing with uh, test anxiety or someone who has a difficult home environment or someone who feels like they don't have anyone to talk to. That mm -hmm. is suffering that's constantly all around us. You know, one of the interesting things, I mean, it's so important, you know, it's, it's great at Berkeley that we are engaged in problems of the world. I think our university does it better than any in the country. Um, but cultivating a compassionate stance towards life doesn't necessarily require give up your savings or you quit school and save people. It really is about cultivating this mind, this, mm -hmm. this mental state. Um, and what we know scientifically is if you as Huria was saying, sort of practice compassion, think about the suffering of others. That actually leads to increases in activation of the vagus nerve, right, which we talked about earlier, Absolutely. which is related to beneficial health. It changes certain patterns of brain activation. It helps your social ties. So even just kind of taking a moment each day to cultivate that mental state mm -hmm. has these benefits out in your life. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's but important. you know, that can be really challenging when, you know, um, for, for students in college, uh, many of whom have deep yeah. problems and, you know, it's very difficult to see beyond the next day, uh, never mind the problems of others. I mean, mm -hmm. people are so wrapped up in their own suffering mm -hmm. that it's hard to see and recognize the suffering of others. Yeah, although, you know, we, I mean, I'd be curious to see what Emiliana and Huria say about this because they've worked on interventions. But what we know neurophysiologically is that kind of practicing compassion like Huria described is the antithesis of a depressive pattern of physiology, mm -hmm. right? It gets you into the empathy networks of your brain. It activates vagus nerve, which calms fight or flight or depressive physiology. So it's a, a, almost an additive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? I would agree. I think it's really broadening your awareness and taking you outside of um, a lot of that self-referential negative yeah. talk and uh, really recognizing that, you know, that common humanity piece that I'm actually not alone in my right. suffering. I'm here on a campus with all these other students who are experiencing some level of pain and suffering. And I think oftentimes uh, when people are experiencing negative emotions and negative affect, it's um, because we lose that common huma humanity piece and we feel isolated. I'd love to revisit the kind of guilt and then uh, the, the idea about compassion, perhaps adding another um, obligation to your to your stressful life. Yeah. You know, when I when I said earlier that Jen and Dacker and I tried to sort of map out the sequence of experiences that happened during compassion. There's this early point uh, when, when you are moved by suffering where some people can uh, feel really personally distressed by it. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, work that comes from Dan Batson years ago, showing that if you see suffering and you kind of go, wow, this feeling reminds me of my own anger or my own fear and anxiety, and, and actually I feel anxious and afraid, you're gonna run away from that experience. You have like the opposite of compassion. And in order to not do that, we have to be 
more mindful. Mm -hmm. We have to be more resilient and capable of relating to that moved feeling in a way that leads to compassion mm -hmm. instead of relating to it as threat to ourselves. And so in a funny way, there's a lot of overlap in these different ideas mm -hmm. that we're talking about. And so becoming more compassionate means relating to your emotions in a healthy and resilient way. Um, and, and, and being guilty, I think, it is important, but not if you're going to think about it in this sort of enduring, stressful way, but rather mm -hmm. feeling it, letting it motivate the right response, and moving mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just to wrap up, you mentioned empathy and compassion. Those are two different things? Mm -hmm. I think of empathy as, as an early, less directed uh, emotional response. We can have an empathic amusement. If you started hysterically laughing, mm -hmm. I would laugh too, not because I feel sorry for your suffering, but because <laughs> I'm mirroring you. Okay. So empathy has this like broad possibility in terms of emotions, and it also doesn't necessarily have that desire to help. It's I'm feeling mm -hmm. something as a result of you expressing, mm -hmm. and I understand what that means in terms of where you are in your life, but not that I necessarily want to help, and that's what really pulls compassion away. So it's so interesting that uh, a feeling like compassion uh, that includes uh, awareness of suffering can actually end up yeah. being related to a physiological profile that's more related to share and care mm -hmm. uh, rather than fight or flight. So that interestingly, and I think what the underlying connection is, uh, as Huria was saying, that that connection to others. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, of course, to the connection to nature, mm -hmm. the book that you, mm -hmm. uh, that you want to read. <laughs> um, and uh, I love the idea of cultivating compassion, in other words, uh, understanding that it might be uncomfortable, that again, it takes practice, mm -hmm. uh, bringing back to us this idea of fake it till you make it. Um, I wanna conclude this section by uh, asking you to uh, talk about some of the resources on campus for uh, cultivating compassion, gratitude, happiness. Um, and let me start with you, Decker. You mentioned a study with trees. Uh, <laughs> and I, I happen to know that that's uh, a particular place on campus. I'm wondering yeah. if there are special places for you that you might, uh, that you might recommend. Yeah, that's a great piece of guidance, Rudy. So I, you know, for people who are at Berkeley, uh, you know, I honestly feel Berkeley is the most aesthetically beautiful campus in the country, and that's not, Boasting is just, you know, may, so make sure, it's almost what Huria was saying, which is that as you walk through campus, right, you stop by and look at the eucalyptus trees mm -hmm. uh, near uh, Oxford and Center, and then you wander by Strawberry Creek and listen to the creek, and then you get to um, the redwood trees by Stra Stra uh, Strawberry Creek, and you get up into the hills. Uh, we now know that five, ten minutes of nature a day like that is very good for the nervous system and the brain and your feelings of compassion. So that'd be my first recommendation. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Hall of Science is, yeah. is this wonderful Fire place trails, to become views. inspired. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. incredible. What about, uh, what about uh, specifically more academic resources uh, for the science of, uh, of pro-social emotion and happiness? Well, so Dacker and I, in the fall of 2014, uh, we launched a, a course, a, a massive open online course called The Science of Happiness. It's on the edX platform. It's free. Uh, we sort of patched together uh, all of Dacker's expertise and all of the 12 years of, of, of resources that, that the Greater Good Science Center has, has amassed into a sort of meaningful 10-week experience where we really go through each of these topics and we tell you about it, we give you articles to read, and we suggest explicitly, here's the practice that studies have shown makes you stronger in this space. And, and, and fun part, hot off the press, People's happiness goes up. People's satisfaction with life goes up. It goes up from before to after the class. It goes up during the class, and it stays up three months later. So um, that's kind of the academic uh, approach you could take if you really want to learn more. And there's also a class you teach, correct? Yeah, so I teach the Science of Happiness at uh -huh. UC Berkeley, which uh, some people here are in. I am. Hopefully doing well. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am. Awesome. Uh, and then um, I think you know, it would really behoove students to look at the Greater Good Science Center's website. Mm -hmm. It's 12 years of curated articles by absolutely the leaders in the field and then students. Mm -hmm. Hurry has written for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
summarizing the science <laughs> in a really friendly way. Mm -hmm. What about compassion? What are some resources for compassion? You know, I, I go back, to, really the, I go back to the Greater Good Science Center. I think they have a lot of really great events and, and articles on the topic of compassion. Um, I've taught the Stanford Compassion Cultivation Training course here at Berkeley. It's a nine-week program and mm -hmm. hope to offer that again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, compassion doesn't necessarily require a resource. It's, it's a, a practice similar to gratitude where you can uh, practice it right now. Um, one resource on gratitude I'll mention is a project that Emiliana has headed up at the Greater Good Science Center called thanksfor.org. Um, and it's uh, an online platform where you can uh, track your gratitude. And uh, I know it's helped me and I think it could be a great resource for others. I love this conversation because Topics like happiness, compassion, and gratitude seem so fleeting, and yet there seems to be not only concrete science around it, but concrete ways that we can act to encourage our behaviors along those lines. Such fascinating work. Dacker, thank you for being here. Huria, Emiliana, your presence is so appreciated. Along with my host, Dri Kavusi, we want to thank you for watching the show today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.